Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Bishop Mark O'Toole is the shepherd of the Catholic Diocese of Plymouth, which covers the beautiful counties of Cornwall, Devon and Dorset in the south of England. With 67 parishes, he has introduced a number of initiatives and evangelization projects which have been well received in the diocese. Welcome to Heart Talk, coming to you today from the Cathedral Church of St. Mary and St. Boniface here in Plymouth. Today, I have the honour and the privilege to be interviewing Bishop Mark O'Toole, the Bishop of Plymouth. Bishop, welcome to Heart Talk. Thank you, Jonathan. Bishop Mark, you once mentioned in your pastoral message that all Christians are called to be disciple-making disciples. How do you think Christians are called to do that? Do you think you could explain that to me, please? It's a phrase um, which really roots itself in the experience of the earliest apostles being called by Jesus Christ. So in, um, in, the, cha in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, um, Jesus calls uh, and he names them and they come close to him. It says in, in that Gospel, he calls them to be with him. So first of all, they're to become his closest followers, to be themselves his disciples. And then in the same verse, it says uh, that he sent them forth. And of course, the, the, one of the last words of the Gospels, uh, particularly in Matthew, is go make disciples. So um, uh, there are two, two dimensions to our Catholic Christian life. Yeah. One is to become close to Jesus Christ, to be his closest disciple. And the other is to go forth to make other disciples. So I was trying to capture those two movements of our life, to come close to him, but also to go forth and to share our encounter with him, with those who do not know him. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I sum it up in three simple sentences, really. Remember that Jesus is your best friend. Try to make a new friend mm -hmm. and try and bring your new friend to Jesus. So in that way, we can all be disciple-making disciples. That's, that's wonderful, Bishop. Thank you. As you are entrusted as the shepherd of the sheep or people of the Diocese of Plymouth, can you tell us about your pastoral work here and the work generally within the diocese? Well, the Diocese of Plymouth covers uh, a large part of the southwest of England, mm -hmm. over 300 miles of coastline, uh, the beautiful counties of Cornwall, Devon and Dorset. It's probably, I believe, the, the most beautiful part of uh, England and Wales. Uh, and it's a great privilege to be the bishop here. And I think the role of the bishop and really the, the heart of the bishop's ministry, pastoral ministry, it goes in two directions, really. Uh, one is towards God uh, and to try and encourage people uh, to make a life uh, centred on God. And secondly, to reach out to other people. So um, the heart of my ministry is visiting parishes and schools and, and leading people in prayer, mm -hmm. um, particularly through the sacraments. I love celebrating the, the sacrament of confirmation yes. in our parishes and celebrating mass and visiting our schools and praying with the children and the young people, but also encouraging people in their personal prayer to put God at the centre of our lives. The other direction I think that, that uh, a bishop's ministry is directed to is to other people mm -hmm. and to reach out, first of all, to communicate something of the faith and to encourage our Catholic community to have the confidence mm -hmm. to bear witness to their own encounter with Jesus Christ. Uh, they say that something like 50% of people in Britain now uh, claim to have no faith. 
So um, that's a real challenge it for is. us yeah, right. to, to, to really have the courage, like those earliest disciples, um, to, to reach out. And that's so initiatives in the diocese to encourage um, Catholics to have the confidence to do that. And the second dimension of that reaching out is to have an eye for the most needy, mm. um, for the poorest. Yes. So many, many of our parishes and local Catholic communities are engaged in wonderful projects to do with um, night shelters for the homeless, mm -hmm. food banks. Yes. Um, there's a lovely initiative in some of our cities called Street Pastors, which is to be a, a loving presence uh, to some of the young people who, are, who maybe are out and who, who maybe drink too much or who are in difficulty. So to be a loving presence on the street to, to accompany them, to make sure they're safe and to make sure they have what they need. I, so, so these different ways, I think, yes. um, you know, to, to love God, to encourage people in that love of God and to love other people in practical ways. Evangelization and reaching out to people across the area is a huge part of the work of Bishop Mark and the Diocese of Plymouth. Many initiatives across the diocese are currently underway, seeking to help people to encounter the Lord in new ways, including the night fever evenings which encourage people to come into a church to light candles in an atmosphere of prayer and have the opportunity to talk. Meanwhile, Christ the King Church in central Plymouth is a venue for hours of Eucharistic adoration during the week, and it has also been designated a permanent shrine of the Blessed Sacrament, an oasis in the city where people can come to rest and pray with Jesus. Bishop, we know that devotion to the Eucharist is a vital part for making disciples and sharing our faith. Your influence in uh, making Corpus Christi a success in the own diocese here and in the UK has made news. Could you explain to us the relevance of the devotion to the Eucharist in today's world? Well, I think um, it's something which uh, I grew, very, grew into very much in my own development of my own faith and coming to realize that Jesus was fully present in the Eucharist was something very profound and made a very deep impact on, on my own heart mm -hmm. when I was a, a young teenager. Um, but I think it's also something which the bishops in England and Wales have collectively uh, tried to promote in these past years. Mm -hmm. So just last year we had um, an initiative in Liverpool for a Eucharistic Congress, which was called Adoramus, Let Us Adore. And that was attended by over 10,000 people. Um, mm -hmm. There were different workshops on the Eucharist, but there were also some lovely experiences of um, the procession on the streets. Mm -hmm which was wonderful to see, of over 10,000 Catholics professing their devotion to Jesus present in the Eucharist. Many social media platforms are ranking you as one of the most influential persons in Plymouth at the moment. Can you share with us how you achieved that? How important is it for the church to be relevant amongst the worshippers of all faiths today? I take this really as a compliment to the Catholic community because I think uh, the bishop always works in close collaboration with his priests, with the religious uh, faithful, and also with, the, with the, lay, the lay people. And there are many, many um, good Catholics kind of making a wonderful contribution to the common good of our society, working in the different areas mm -hmm. of health, in education, um, even in local government. Um, one of the things, I mean, I've tried to do, I suppose, since I came uh, to, to the diocese five and a half years ago, uh, is I've tried to be present at the significant moments in the civic life of the area. Mm. Um, so annually, um, there is the um, important day of remembrance of, of those who've died uh, in the world wars that's of right. the past hundred years or so. Yes, that's right. Uh, and it's a very profound moment. I mean, Plymouth is a, a city which has a long Navy tradition. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important day in the life of, of the local area. Many people have um, members of their family who've been 
in the Navy or are connected to elements mm. of, of the armed forces. So it's very important to gather with uh, those servicemen and women to give thanks mm -hmm. for their generosity, but also to remember those who gave their lives in such generous ways. Also, I think um, Plymouth was badly bombed during the war. There was a very important anniversary, the 75th anniversary of the Blitz, um, which devastated the city. Mm. So it was very important to be present at those different moments. And I think, I suppose also to, to allow the cathedral here uh, to be an important place in which some of these memories are held mm. and brought together. So the centenary of the um, both the beginning and the end of, of the First World War have kind of covered four of my years. So between 2014 and yes. 2018. Yes. And there were different moments when we had um, uh, celebrations, commemorations in the cathedral. And that was, I think, very important to be able to do that. Bishop Mark was born in London, the youngest son of Marcus and Mara O'Toole, who came originally from the Irish-speaking community of Connemara, Galway, in Ireland. He studied for the priesthood at Allen Hall Seminary, graduating with a Bachelor of Divinity in Theology, followed by an MPhil in Theology from the University of Oxford. He then served several parishes as a deacon and a priest. In 2002, he became private secretary to Cardinal Murphy O'Connor, the Archbishop of Westminster, and six years later was appointed rector of Allen Hall Seminary. In January 2014, he was ordained the ninth Bishop of Plymouth, succeeding Bishop Hugh Christopher Budd. How significant is faith in the family and togetherness in prayer, especially uh, something we, we do at home? For my wife and myself, our faith is the foundation of our relationship. Are you able to explain a bit further? Well, I think it's, it's for, most, for most believers, the family is the first place that they hear about God and they hear about the service of others, the love of others, the love of God and the love of neighbour. And that was certainly true in my own family. Uh, my parents um, were migrants uh, to England from the west of Ireland. My father came really for economic reasons as a young 15-year-old to find work. There weren't those possibilities in the west of Ireland in the 1930s. It was, it was difficult. And so he, um, he came actually in the, uh, later in the 1950s. And my mother came for health reasons. She had two older sisters who had died from tuberculosis. So she came because her family felt that she would have a better quality of life. At that difficult time, thank mm. goodness, um, things have developed in Ireland and many other parts of Europe so that those difficulties are no longer present. Mm -hmm. But they met and they married uh, in London and they were part of a, an Irish-speaking community because their first language was Irish. So they had to learn English. So I have a, I have a great soft spot for many migrant communities nowadays because it, it reflects something of my own experience. But in the home, um, it was where we first learnt to pray. Um, we would always pray the rosary, usually at night, mm -hmm. um, kneeling into the chair in a circle, uh, the five of us, my mother and father and us three boys. Mm -hmm. Although we were in a circle, we weren't faced towards one another. We were kneeling into the, each of our chairs. And that taught me, without, without a big lesson or a lecture, it taught me that prayer was opening oneself to the other, the other who is God. Um, but also because it was the rosary that Mary, our mother, is close to us and the, the, the church is a place uh, which is like a home. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the family is the place that we learn these things for many, many of us. And therefore, I think I'm delighted that in, in many of our communities to encourage uh, the prayer in the home, mm -hmm. the passing on of the faith from from parent to child. I think it's very important. Th thank you, Bishop. You once said we are in mission territory, mm. just like in Pakistan or I think Burma, you, you quoted. How much and how have we fallen behind and how can we rectify that and get back on track with our Christian faith? 
In some ways in England, it's, it's always been mission territory. Um, we, in this part of the Southwest, we, we have the, we have the great privilege of knowing um, and having uh, one of our members, St Boniface, from That's the right. 8th, you go back the 8th century, mm. so mm. 14, 1400 mm. years ago, mm. 13, 1400 years ago. And um, Boniface became the great missionary, particularly to, to Germany. He became known as the Apostle of Germany. But he grew, he, he, he was born and grew up in this part of Europe. And um, first of all, he was formed within a, a life of prayer in a Benedictine monastery. But he always had this sense that he was being called to go out uh, and to bring Christ to others. The first lesson to learn is that um, his first mission was a failure. And that's important for us today because we must never lose courage. Yes, I agree. Even if at times, um, in trying to bear witness to our faith, in sometimes what can feel like very rocky soil mm. um, and sometimes a, an environment which seems almost against us um, or where there seems a disinterest about what we believe. It's always important to remember the first mission of St Boniface that, it, that he failed and he came back to Devon and he obviously prayed harder and then he was called to go again a second time and he became very successful and spread the faith throughout Germany and parts of of Northern Europe. And ultimately, Mark was martyred for his faith whilst he was about to celebrate the Sacrament of Confirmation mm -hmm. in what's now the Netherlands at the age of 79. So even the older people yes. um, in yeah. our country have still a job to do in witnessing and to have that courage. Um, but we do live in a society in this part of Europe where many, many people almost seem to have become tired with faith. Mm. And you do need to have a kind of, you need to have a courage. You need to have a kind of inner strength. You need to draw on your relationship with Jesus Christ in order to be able to bear witness to him, to your friends, to people at work, to people you meet in daily life. Whenever the moments arrive, uh, in order to be able to be faithful to that gift of faith that's been given to us. What is your plan for more vocations for the diocese here in, in the West Country? Well, I think priestly vocations, uh, like all vocations, um, develop and grow within a life of faith. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll, you know, in this country, you meet many newspaper articles and um, reports which speak about a crisis mm. of priestly vocations. I think the crisis is really a crisis of disciples, a crisis of faith, um, because um, vocations to the priesthood come from a kind of a, a community of faith that's alive. So, so I think we must try and build what I, what we call a culture of vocation within, within, the, within the life of faith. So within the parishes, within our schools, the sense that, that Christ is alive, mm -hmm. that he is present to us, that he has a particular role and an invitation to each person. Um, I like to, to use a phrase which comes from a, from a document of, of the Holy See, which was reflecting on vocations in Europe. And it said that, that um, every person has a vocation, but the vocation really is the dream of God, which is in the heart of God for each person. It's evident in the intergenerational dialogue within the Plymouth Diocese here, um, that it has helped the young and the elderly uh, interact and create a healthy bond. How helpful do you think is in the overall spiritual growth of the church here? I think listening to uh, different generations, one generation listening to another is very important. Part of our society would present, present an image that it's only the, only the new which is important and significant and in that sense, maybe marginalise the elderly and marginalise the wisdom of the older generation. Yet we know within our, within our human experience how important uh, the wisdom of the older can be. 
Um, one of the great privileges that I have uh, is celebrating the Sacrament of Confirmation mm. in the diocese. And it's a time when you get to meet a large number of, of particularly teenagers. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been very touched and very impressed to witness um, a, a large number of our teenage, teenagers speak of how much they appreciate their grandparents. Oh, yeah. The witness of their grandparents, mm -hmm. uh, the courage of their grandparents, the faith of their grandparents. They know that their grandparents love them mm -hmm. and they know that their grandparents want what's best for them. And how important grandparents are very often, particularly in a society like ours, mm -hmm. um, where parents are often very pressured mm -hmm. and very busy and therefore grandparents have an important role within the family. Um, providing that sort of blanket of support and love, mm -hmm. uh, but also providing that wisdom. And of course, it's true within our Catholic faith. We know that, that what's passed down from generation to generation is deeply enriching. Um, I think uh, on the other side, I think we mustn't ever be um, negative or cynical about our young people. There's great spirit of generosity in young people. There's also lots of energy there. Mm. And our church needs both of those elements. It needs the wisdom of the older generations, but it also needs the vitality and vibrancy and the energy of the young. The Synod in, in Rome for Young People, mm. one of the things I was reminded of was a lovely saying of Pope St. John XXIII, who said, to the older here, I would say, remember that the church will exist after you. And to the younger here, I would say, remember that the church existed before you. And I think there's a lot of wisdom is, in that. There is, there is. Thank you again for your time, Bishop. I'm delighted to ask this prayer and blessing upon all who are watching through Shalom World TV. We ask the Holy Spirit to be with us as we gather in this place today. And I give thanks in this prayer for the witness of so many Christians gathered together that the Holy Spirit may come upon us this day. Lord, go before your holy people, guide their footsteps in the ways of your love and your peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.